Hey everybody, this is Patrick JMT. I'm partnering with Chegg, and here we're gonna talk about the definite integral. And whoa, Nelly, we're gonna have a lot of information crammed into this video. So we'll talk about the definition of the definite integral and its relationship to area. Um, I wanna emphasize, let's, we'll come back to this um, when we talk about areas underneath curves. So let's hit on that. We'll also talk about evaluating a definite integral using the definition. This is gonna be analogous to finding the derivative using the definition, right? You have to use that limit as h approaches zero, blah, blah, blah. It's long and tedious. Then you use all the, you learn all these derivative shortcuts. This is gonna be very analogous. We're gonna learn the, the hard way to compute the area using the definition, and then you'll start seeing nice shortcuts. But for now, we're gonna pay the piper and do it the hard way. Okay, so you may have seen this. The idea is we break our, our interval. So I, I'm trying to find the area underneath this curve, y equals f of x, on some interval a to b. So I'm interested in, in this area. Again, I can only talk about this as being area if our function is above the x-axis. That is, the y values are positive. Okay, so I'm trying to compute this area. The idea is we chop it up into n pieces, and each of our little intervals is gonna have width delta x. And delta x, well, the length of the intervals, b minus a, we would divide that by n <clears throat> to, get, to get the value of delta x. And we label these points. Um, a, we're gonna call that x sub zero. Our value of b here, we'll call that x sub n. Then my next point, that would be x sub one. And then my next x coordinate would be x sub two, et cetera. Um, eventually, we'll, we'll label one generically here. Let's suppose that's the x coordinate x sub i minus one. That's the x coordinate x sub i, I don't know. And then eventually we get to the nth one, the last one. The idea is, what we do is we take we make rectangles, um, either using left endpoints, right endpoints. <clears throat> it's going to turn out you can use what's called a sample point. So a sample point is any point in that interval. So maybe I've got a little uh, sample sample point here. I can label that x sub i star. It's in the interval from x sub i minus 1 up to x sub i. You could use a left endpoint. You could use the right endpoint. You can use the midpoint. You can use anything. It doesn't matter. Just take one from each interval. If I use right endpoints, <clears throat> my first rectangle, um, I know the width. I could compute the height by plugging x sub 1 into our function, and then I would just keep doing this for every rectangle. I would do this over the entire region, and I could add those up. So if I add those up, the shorthand, so i equals 1 to n, I'm taking my points f of x sub i, and I'm multiplying that by delta x. So this, the f of x sub i, again, gives me the height of my rectangle. The delta x represents the width, which is fixed for all of them. Again, the height is, is changing. And this just says add all, of, all n of them up. <clears throat> so this right now would be an approximation. This would simply be an approximation. Um, sorry, my summation sign's killing me there. Let's rewrite that. Oh, that looks so much better. i equals 1 to n. So that would be an approximation to the area. Well, to get the, the true area, again, what we do is we take a limit. We use more and more rectangles. So we chop it up into more and more pieces. That's going to be the true area. And like I said a second ago, it really doesn't... So the way I've got it set up right now, I'm using the right endpoint. It really doesn't matter as, as long as you take a point from each interval. So we can even just write it as f of x sub i star. That's the definition. So um, I'm not going to read all of this to you. You can uh, pause it if you need to and, and read. Uh, but it basically just summarizes what we just did. So some new notation, and this is going to be important. So we're interested in this limit. The way that we write it, uh, the notation is, we use this symbol. It looks like an elongated S for a summation. That's the idea. And we have what are called limits of integration. And then we just put whatever function we're using. So the value a is going to be our upper limit of integration. Um, our value, I've got them, I flip-flopped them there. It doesn't really matter. Uh, well, it would for, for my previous example. Um, so a is going to be our lower limit of integration. b will be our upper limit of integration, just known as the integral sign. The function f of x that you're using, that's called the integrand. So f of x is my integrand. And it's worth pointing out again, this definite integral, it's a number. That's what you're computing. You're getting a number out at the end of the day. And as I say here, it can be positive, negative, or zero. 
So let's come back to this for a second, this idea. Suppose I'm computing this definite integral from the interval a to b, and here's my function f of x. Suppose this region has area a1, and this little triangular region has area a2. Well, that definite integral, it would be the area of a1 plus the area of a2, whatever they are. Now suppose my function f of x is below the x-axis. I can't talk about areas anymore. When I compute this definite integral, it's not an area. I mean, areas right are, are either an area is either zero or positive. Suppose this this shaded region though has area a one. So suppose that shaded region has some area. When I compute that definite integral, I would get the value. I would get the negative of the integral. And let's look at one last example. Suppose it crisscrosses. So suppose this little region has area a1, and this little region down here has area a2. Well, to compute that definite integral, I would take a1, the value above, and I would subtract away the area below. Okay, so just wanted to talk about that geometry really quickly. Okay, so let's talk about actually computing a definite integral using the, the definition. So we want to compute this definite integral from 1 to 2 of x squared plus 3x dx. Now, these are, can be tedious and a little bit long, so we'll try to make sense out of it. I've got these formulas here on the right side um, that we're going to need to evaluate these definite integrals. If you've got a quiz or a test, you may ask your instructor, hey, do we need to have these memorized? They'll say, yeah, no, whatever, and uh, you'll go from there. Okay, so we've got to fill in a couple things. I've got to figure out a value for delta x, and I've also got to figure out a value for x sub i. Okay, so delta x is going to be the length of the interval. Well, that's b minus a. So I take the upper limit, subtract away the lower limit, divide by n. So that's going to be 1 over n. Now I need to get a value for x sub i. Now how on earth do I get a value for x sub i? <clears throat> Let's go back to our, our previous picture here in a second. I could just give you the formula. So the, the way that we get our x sub i value, suppose we wanted to figure out what x sub 1 would equal. Suppose I wanted to figure out x sub 1, for example. Well, that would I could take the lower limit, which is a, and I've moved over how much? Well, this interval has width delta x, so I've moved over just uh, one increment of delta x. Well, what would x sub 2 equal? Well, it would equal... x sub 2 would equal the value um, x sub 1 plus another delta x, right? I would need to move over another delta x, so x sub 2 would actually equal a plus 2 times delta x. And you can continue this pattern. In general, x sub i is going to be the lower limit of integration, a, plus i multiplied by delta x. Okay, so let's go back down here. So that's another very useful formula to, to remember. I mean, uh, you can derive it pretty easily, but I think it's worth just, just having in your back, back pocket. Okay, well, I can fill this in because I know my lower limit of integration. That's my a value, which in this case is 1. I know my delta x value because we just computed it. That's 1 over n. And I'm multiplying that by i. Okay, now we're going to fill all of this stuff in. Uh, we're going to fill in this definition using that information. Okay, so it says the integral is going to equal the limit as n goes to infinity. I've got the summation from i equals 1 to n. Now, I've got a function to play with here, right? f of x is x squared plus 3x. So I'm going to plug in my x sub i uh, in for x. Okay, so it said instead of x squared, I've got x sub i, which is 1 plus, I'm going to write this as i over n. So 1 plus i over n. That's my replacing my x squared, plus 3 times x sub i, which again is 1 plus i over n. And I'm multiplying that by, by delta x, which we said is 1 over n. Okay, <clears throat> now we have to somehow uh, clean all this up and simplify it. So let's do that. Okay, so I've got the limit as n goes to infinity. My 1 over n, I can pull it in front of the summation, but it needs to stay to the right of the limit. So I'm going to do that. We'll come back to that here in a minute. Whoa. 
So i equals one to n. Now I've just got to clean up this expression. So if I take one plus i over n and square it, one plus o over i over n multiplied by one plus i over n, it looks like I would get one plus, I would get an i over n plus an i over n, or two i over n. Then I would get i over n times i over n, or i squared over n squared. Then if we distribute, it looks like we'll just have three plus three i over n. And okay, let's just keep simplifying. So I've got the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n. I've got my summation, i equals one to n. Let's just combine like terms now. So however you wanna do them. Um, let's see, we've got a one plus a three or a four. We've got a two i over n and a three i over n. So that would give me five i over n. Plus we've got this one i squared over n squared. Okay, so we're having fun so far. So we've got the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n. Now you can think about breaking up the summation. So I've got the summation from i equals one to n of four plus the summation from i equals one to n of five i over n plus the summation from i equals one to n of i squared over n squared. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna do one other thing here. Um, so again, the i's have to stay to the right of the summations. So I'm gonna rewrite this though. I could write that as the summation, right? I had five i over n. I'm gonna pull the five over n out front and then, then I'm just left with i, the summation from one to n of i. And I'll do the same thing with this one as well. I can pull that, oh, the, the one over n squared out front. So plus one over n squared multiplied by i squared. This is where we use all of these useful formulas now. So we've got the limit as n goes to infinity of one over n. So if I sum up from one to n of four, that says you're doing four plus four plus four plus four n times. Well, I would have four times n after I do that. If you sum up from one to n of i, so you're doing one plus two plus three plus four plus five up to n, you get n multiplied by n plus one over two. And again, that's this formula right here. You can see the formula uh, for the summation from one to n of i squared. We get, let's write this down. So we get this formula again, n times n plus one times two n plus one, n times n plus one times two n plus one, all over six. Okay, so notice the summation's gone now. Now we're just down to a limit problem. So we are getting, we are getting closer. I'm gonna do a little simplification. Notice uh, I've got an n over an n squared. So I could cancel out you know, this n and just be left with an n to the first in the denominator. Okay, what I'm gonna do now is this one over n that's just been hanging out watching, watching the action, I'm gonna distribute that to every term. So I've got the limit as n goes to infinity. I distribute uh, one over n times four n. Well, the n's would cancel and I would just be left with four. Plus, now I'm gonna do a couple things here at once. So notice I've got five over two. So, okay, there's my five over two. Notice in the numerator, if I distribute, I would have n squared plus n. Okay, now I had this n hanging out here already. But again, I haven't multiplied by one over n yet. That's gonna give me a one over n squared. And I'm gonna put that n squared in the denominator. You'll see why in just a second. Okay, same thing for my, my uh, when I distribute to the last one. Notice, okay, so you could multiply this all out if you want to. Um, so I've got my six in the denominator. So let's, let's keep that one. Maybe we'll pull that one out front, one over six. If I multiply one over n by one over n, that's gonna give me one over n squared. So there's my n squared. In the numerator, if we multiply it out, we would have two n squared, what will we get? Plus n, plus two n, plus three n, uh, plus one if I distribute all of this stuff out, stuff out and collect like terms. Well, now this is where I can take limits. And you may remember like finding limits of rational functions. You may remember that, that trick, if the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, you get the ratio of those coefficients. That's what we're gonna use here. So the limit of a constant is just constant four. 
Okay, there's my five halves hanging out. Now, if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared plus n over n squared, again, the coefficients on my highest powers are the same. I take the ratio of those coefficients. So one over one is what I'm multiplying my five halves by. There's my one sixth. And again, if I take the limit as n goes to infinity of this two n squared plus three n plus one over n squared, again, I'm focusing on the highest powers, n squared and n squared. And again, I take the ratio of those coefficients. So that would be multiplied by two over one. Hallelujah, we are almost there. So this is four plus five halves plus um, two over six or one third. I'm done, you guys can finish that out. That's just arithmetic. Okay, and that would be your solution. So um, that is computing a definite integral using the definition. There's a lot in there, be careful. The idea though, again, um, replace your x sub i with your a plus delta x times i. First find delta x so that you can use that. And then just replace all your x's with that x sub i term. Um, and then it's just a bunch of arithmetic, breaking up uh, summations, and then just using these formulas, again, to, to get rid of the summation. Using these formulas to get rid of the summations. If, if this had been something different, you know, if I was integrating from 1 to 2 of, of sine x plus 3x, good luck using this stuff, right? Because I don't know, I would get stuck really quickly. And this was part of the problem historically. People were like, we know how to set it up, we just don't know mechanically how to compute it. It's going to turn out there's a much easier way to compute these. That's, again, going to be the magic of calculus. So there's an easy way to do it, but for now, we're doing it the, the complicated way. And, but, but the complicated way is important because that's, that's the concept. That's where this stuff comes from, and that's why it makes sense to do it this way. So, all right, again, a long example, but I think it should cover a lot of bases if you do have to do these types of uh, definite integrals using this definition.